We're going to be talking today about prescription and more generally about the role of the state in anti-fascism. If you like what you hear, then we have a Patreon. Uh, we're really grateful for the support we've been getting. Uh, that's patreon.com slash 12 rules for what. My name is Sam. And I'm Alex. And you can also uh, rate and review us on iTunes or other podcast apps. That really helps us as well. And otherwise, spread the word about what we're doing. We're basing this, this episode on uh, an afterword we've written uh, for a new book that's coming out by free, uh, from Freedom Press called The Trouble with a- National Action uh, by an anti-fascist author called Mark Hayes. And... Our afterward um, focus on um, the aftermath of the ba- state banning of national action, which took place in uh, December 2016. And we want to think through what kind of role the state plays in anti-fascism and uh, how we can relate to that as anti-fascists. Because it is, uh, the state holds a very ambiguous position within kind of anti-fascist politics. In, for some anti-fascists, such as... Um, um, research groups like Hope Not Hate, the state is uh, the ultimate solution to a lot of uh, the, a lot of the fascist threat. Um, fascists should be reported to the police, they should be arrested, they should be sent to prison for hate crimes, threats of violence, um, organising under a, under a prescription. Um, and they should be voted out as well. So they should, they, it's always... Um, Anti-fascism is medi- mediated through the electoral process. So don't vote for the BNP, vote for Labour. Um, don't vote for the Brexit party, uh, vote for whoever else, you know. Um, and on the militant side, the state is seen as, um, you know, the ultimate, almost the ultimate fascist evil. Um, uh, uh, the kind of uh, clearest expression of, of kind of authoritarianism. Um, and I think, well, at least I argue, and Sam can chime in as well, um, there, these are really kind of simplistic views of how the state operates and why it operates. Um, there's, the, the police don't necessarily always protect the fascists, and we need we need to uh, we need to reckon with that and understand the actual process and the motivations that are going on um, with these state agencies. Uh, what do you think, Sam? I, I completely agree with you so far. We're going to talk first of all about the uh, the state's relation to the British Union of Fascists who are also known as the Black Shirts, they have the largest um, fascist movement in the UK ever. Tell us about how the state related to the BUF. The classic conception of kind of the, the journey of the life of the BUF uh, for, for many years, um, up until the 1970s, um, was that uh, the British Union fascists started off a small kind of splinter set up by Oswald Mosley, in the in the early 30s, uh, growing until it was adopted by... Um, a kind of wider um, slice of a bourgeois middle class society, uh, and and therefore gains some kind of like uh, sway within kind of uh, popular popular um, kind of politics. Fascism had not yet been tainted by the um, the the specter of the Second World War or the the, the atrocities of the Nazis, and uh, and so it was in many in many circles seen as this vital force that was going to um, remake British society, uh, kind of a vitalising presence that was going to recapture uh, empire and, and fortify the British empire across the world. It's really important to remember that in the, within the BUF's kind of ideology, it wasn't just about uh, capturing old uh, imperial glories, but building on them, uh, creating a new empire, and yet protecting that um, kind of uh, empire as well. The kind of classic conception of the of the, of the BUF journeys that w- once adopted in 1934, uh, they with an explosion of growth to about 50 to 40 to 50 thousand mef- members, they were eventually renounced by the Daily Mail, which was a short-lived endorsement. A notable um, confrontation, the Battle of Cable Street in East London, and uh, a violent rally in Olympia, um, in which uh, you know cl- the fascist activists clashed with anti-fascist protesters uh, frequently. Um, and after the the institution of the the Public Order Act in 1936, the British Union of Fascists went into a, a a decline that lasted until until the Second World War. And eventually, when the remaining fascist activists were interned and kept in camps, there was around a thousand of them left. 
and this was the small nub that survived through the Second World War, the, you know, the hardcore zealots that survived through the Second World War and, and came back to prominence and trying to sa- found new things like the League of Empire Loyalists and the Union Movement and and things like this in the in the in the late forties, fifties, sixties. And and that and and that's kind of it kind of paints a neat picture of like a certain conception of anti fascism in that kind of liberal outrage or like popular outrage against uh, perceived kind of slights against uh, public order or public decency uh, in the form of violence or street violence attracted the attention of the state uh, in order to clamp down on it and, and, and stop it from growing. And it's a really it's a really convenient story to tell about the British Union fascists because it, it weaves in a lot of um, kind of the glory of Cable Street and the pressure that took put on the on the on the BUF along with the kind of liberal kind of uh, uh, platitudes towards you know the state needs to come in and uh, uh, and clamp down on this kind of extremism. The Public Order Act itself was 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 brought in. Um, in order to kind of clamp down on the excesses of the BUF uh, to a large extent um, and the kind of public disorder they created um, uh, with their kind of anti-fascist counterparts. A lot of the provisions of the Act are, 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 are aimed squarely at the BUF. Um, so the kind of limitations on processions, which was like a big tactic of the British Union fascists to, to march through areas and march and grow, which is a classic, classic fascist tactic. There was also a kind of ban on political uniforms. The kind of wording of the of the act was left deliberately vague by the writers of the act, which weren't just politicians, but also like civil servants and kind of other interested members of the kind of state bureaucracy, um, in order to to target the black shirts and and their kind of use of uh, use of uniforms as like a unifying a unifying force. Um, and it's also important to remember that a lot of the Although a lot of the kind of aspects of the Public Order Act were kind of superseded by new public public order acts, uh, mainly one in 1980s, um, uh, some parts of the the Public Order Act, the original 1936 Public Order Act, uh, remain in effect today, and, and people are still being arrested under those provisions. So in the 1970s, supporters of Sinn Féin and the IRA um, were arrested in Speaker's Corner in London um, for wearing berets that was construed to be a political uniform uh in february 2016 members of uh britain first two leaders of britain first um paul golding and jada franzen uh were tried and convicted of uh, wearing political uniforms uh public uh action but the reason we're spending so much time on the public order act is i kind of see that act as kind of a model of of the kind of legislation that was brought in much later um including um, the kind of main topic of our discussion today, which is the 2000 Terrorism Act, which brought in the broad prescription powers in which um, national action eventually came to be banned under in December 2016. So this was kind of the dominant view into the 70s. And the reason why it wasn't really challenged very much is because it was actually really difficult. It's really difficult still to, to, to know how many members the BUF actually had. They, their membership lists were jealously guarded by the organisation. And so what scraps we can pick up on, historians can pick up on, comes across very patchy. And there are some periods that we'll basically never know the numbers. The kind of sources we do use and which a lot of people kind of rely on are kind of very special branch reports. So a special branch was like in the precursor to all the counter-terror policing and like the, the specialist policing units and MI5 um that we have today, and um, we get a lot of the, a lot of the membership and the kind of estimates of membership come from um, the memoirs of uh, BUF uh, uh, organisers, which are obviously going to paint paint a certain picture, and special branch as well. The story that's told of the um, the kind of peak and then the the, the, the slow de- the long decline of the BUF is essentially now thought to be uh, wrong, and the, and in fact the BUF did have a, a sharp decline in 1935, see so a sharp decline in membership after the Daily Mail pulls its endorsement and after the kind of uh, the Public Order Act um, uh, is, is starting to come into motion um, as people kind of flee the, uh, uh, flee what's seen as like a kind of, uh, a, a, a violent kind of sinking uh, prospect. But instead of this kind of long sustained decline, what historians now actually think is that the BUF actually saw a steady rise in membership right up until 1939, 1940, into the Second World War. So instead of like an estimate of, say, 9,000 members um, with like 5,000 
active members. At the start of the Second World War, we now it's now believed to be the BUF to have membership of around 22,000, which is still a lot less than their peak of in 1934 of around 40,000 members, but is still still the largest amount of membership they've ever had in their organisation uh, aside from their peak. And the reason why these misconceptions happened was it's not it wasn't just it was it wasn't just a convenient story to tell. Uh, it was also that special branch kind of estimates were based on uh, what's called as Division One lists. Now the BUF was divided up into three kind of divisions, uh, defined by how active your membership of the organisation was and what position you held when you were a supporter or whatever. And so these the initial estimate of nine of nine thousand members uh, was based on just Division One lists which is like the most active category of membership. And now we, 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 now we know that the BUF uh, deliberately kept their passive, more passive supporters list out of their headquarters and so out of the hands of the special branch in order to kind of hide the, um, the kind of middle class or like kind of quiet supporter of, of fascism from the scrutiny of, of the state or the, or the press. And the, 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 the important thing to understand here is that you can track much more closely the BUF's kind of membership to the kind of divisions and unity and prospects of the Conservative Party. In times of uh, kind of disunity within the Conservative, within the Tories, uh, the BUF membership uh, swelled and grew. Uh, the closer war came about, the, the more disunited the Conservatives were becoming, the, the more the BUF gained strength. And we, we can see parallels, par- parallels of this today. And of course, the BUF are not in any way uh, comparable to the Brexit party, who is uh, you know, an elect- a, a, a straight electoral force without any of the militias or kind of uniforms or mad songs or whatever. We can see that the, the further right parties to the Tories do better uh, when the Tories are weak. Um, in fact, the Public Order Act had little effect. And in fact, the Public Order Act um, may, can be argued to have helped the BUF uh, regain its membership or reorient itself towards new membership um, by constricting its uh, the, its uh, ability to use political uniforms and by constricting its ability uh, to do processions. Uh, the BUF actually innovated um, its way uh, around these problems and kind of in many ways moderated their act and moderated their kind of public presentation, and were able to grow str- uh, more steadily off the back of that. Um, and it's interesting to note that um, it was only until the advert, it was only up until the advent of the Second World War, when you know lines were drawn and the state was really wasn't going to tolerate very much, uh, you know, pro kind of pro fascist sentiment, uh, that the BUF were, were allowed to continue, um, you know, well in about a year into the. Uh, or just to the outbreak of a year into the Second World War. There, there's quite interesting dynamics in that in the, the, the Public Order Act 36 appears to have pushed the BUF actually to moderate, whereas when we're going to come on to talk about national action and prescription under the Terrorism Act 2000, as soon as a group is prescribed, that is, it's completely banned, actually there's a tendency towards more and more extreme behaviour, more and more extreme demonstrations of political intent. Uh, yes, and the, but the point is that, the point is not that um, uh, state intervention naturally has a moderating effect on political movements or groups or far right movements and groups. It is that the the effects of of, of, of large scale state action or broad brush state action um, uh, can have unintended consequences and can uh, at the same time help and hurt uh, make an, uh, make a movement or an organisation more dangerous or less dangerous at the same time. National action uh, were was certainly inher- really smashed up. And uh, a lot of their leadership were put in prison and they were really hurt from the prescription. Um, but it also had this uh, consequence of splintering and making groups more extreme, more dangerous, more willing to commit violence um, and less easy to monitor and control. Um, and we really need to uh, take this kind of uh, swerve into account. Um, so prescription... Um, as we refer to it today, was a kind of specific set of laws and powers uh, brought in under the Terrorism Act of 2000, um, which was uh, kind of instituted and driven through by um, the new Labour government of Tony Blair. The IRA and the loyalist groups were already under certain orders, under separate legislation, and they indeed they are now today. It says in the prescription kind of 
guide that the government publishes that the there's 14 North of Ireland based groups that are prescribed under separate North of Ireland specific legislation. But I'm sure these kind of those kind of laws were used as models for this one. And so what 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 is prescription? What do we mean when by by the word prescription? Uh, prescription is a specific power wielded by the Home Secretary, and it's one of the most authoritarian powers that that's available to the British state. A group can be prescribed as terrorists if uh, they are seen to be promoting, glorifying, or conducting planning uh, violence towards political, uh, religious, racial, or ideological ends. Um, when doing a prescription, the Home Secretary has to take in certain factors, like the threat they pose to British citizens, the threat they uh, pose to Britain, their propensity to cause widespread damage or harm to populations or property, or even disruption. It, it can also take into account international matters. Um, so if an ally is uh, has prescribed a group and is asking the, uh, the government to prescribe a group, um, even if it's not directly affecting Britain, that is can also be taken into account. Once the group is prescribed, and to be clear, there's no, there's, there's no, there's no need for a law being passed for, um, uh, for a group to be prescribed. It immediately becomes illegal to be a member of the prescribed organisation. Um, it becomes illegal to uh, profess support for uh, the prescribed organisation, and that includes expressing you know, financial support, um, political, ideological support, but also just like moral support, like uh, expressions of solidarity with the prescribed organisation, this kind of thing. It also becomes an offence to wear items of clothing that have logos of the prescribed group on it or slogans of the prescribed group uh, on your person. And, and the penalties that are come along with these crimes are extremely severe. So if you're convicted of being a member uh, of a prescribed group, you can get a maximum of 10 years in prison, which is a long time. The same if you express support for a group. If you're approved to express public support for an organ a prescribed organisation, you can get up to 10 years in prison. Wearing an article of clothing with a prescribed group's logo on it uh, is less severe. You will only get six months in prison and, a, and an up to £5,000 uh, fine. That's still, that's still pretty hardcore. At the present time, there are around 71 groups that are prescribed. A lot of these like international Islamist, uh, political Islamist uh, groups. You've got some classics on there. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, you know, classic prescribed groups. <laughs> <laughs> Just classic, you know. Um, okay. Uh, the vast majority of these are um, not based in the UK, uh, not just Islamist groups. There's the PKK, uh, which is a you know a Kurdish um, a nationalist party, um, which is considered a terrorist group by the Turkish state. Uh, there's one group that stands out amongst these you know 71 or so groups, and that is uh, National Action, which is the only extreme right organisation to be prescribed or um, in the UK, and indeed it's the only extreme far right group to be banned uh, by the British state since the BUF. Um, was prescribed during the Second World War uh, and internment camps. So that's how kind of, in some ways, momentous the decision to prescribe the group was. It was a complete break from like um, current state policy. So it's also worth saying that National Action isn't the only far-right group uh, on the list anymore. There are now several other groups that are also on the list, but they're also there because they are simply renamings of National Action. So one of the kind of uh, tactics that um, it, lots of Islamist groups would do was uh, simply kind of swap the leadership around and change the name of the group and they kind of pop up again with basically exactly the same membership but not prescribed and so there was a innovation i guess like an, or an addition to the law um the description to the terrorism act that allowed the state to um, also ban groups automatically that were sufficiently um similar to other groups that are on the list and so there are now other groups i think scottish dawn are now uh, also prescribed groups because they are basically simply splits or factions or, or derivations of national action i mean here's the strange thing about it is that citizens resistance network is not prescribed um it hasn't been prescribed and neither has groups like we're going to dis discuss later but like sonnen creed decision or fear creed division um the groups that have been prescribed as aliases of national action are scottish dawn and um NS131, which is National Socialism um, 131. Anti, anti capitalist action. It's pretty. So we, we talked about how easy it is to prescribe a group. Um, really, you need uh, basically someone to uh, write up uh, a specific piece of political rhetoric in order to justify uh, the prescription, the banning, um, and, and, and put it before Parliament. 
and there's not so many checks behind that. Deprescription um, is incredibly rare. And since 2000, uh, only three groups have been uh, taken off the prescribed uh, list. To get deprescribed, an application has to be made to the Home Secretary. Um, evidence presented in that application has certain protections to it, which means it can't be used um, as a as like kind of reason to further prescribe uh, an organisation or to further justify a prescription. And like I said, yeah, three groups uh, in since in the last um, 19 years have been uh, uh, deprescribed. So why were national action prescribed? Um, so the reason national action prescribed is is in the wake of the murder of the Labour MP Joe Cox, there was a kind of general outcry and the Tory government kind of needed to be seen to be doing something. Um, it was clear that the, the man who had murdered Joe Cox, so Thomas Mayer, the, the murderer of Joe Cox, was clearly a far-right activist. He, in his uh, one of his early court appearances, instead of giving his name, he said, uh, death to traitors, freedom for Britain. And, and to be seen to be doing something... Uh, the UK government picked out the the, the most reprehensible, the most uh, outrageous uh, Nazi group they could find, which is National Action, in order to kind of make an example of them in many respects. And it, it wasn't just National Action that were kind of floated the potential to be banned. There was also groups like Northwest Infidels, who um, were kind of talked about as being banned, uh, that could be banned, that, which are, the Northwest Infidels are like a Nazi group that were a splinter from the EDL. Um, and also... There was talk of, of 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 bigger groups being banned, which did, didn't actually come to pass. And uh, now, why why National Action Pacific in particular? Um, National Action built their kind of reputation on these extremely racist, provocative actions. Um, so the famous one of the famous ones is, is putting a banana in the in the hands of the Nelson Nelson Man Mandela statue and doing Hitler salutes in front of it. Now, you can't get much more uh, uh, kind of provocative. Um, a racist Nazi than that. In the aftermath of the the murder of Joe Cox, they they can they they kind of been on a political journey in in that they were getting more extreme, more provocative, and as they were becoming under more scrutiny, they just went more and more extreme. So in the aftermath of the murder of Joe Cox, National Action tweeted when Nazis were still allowed to have Twitter accounts. You know, six hundred and forty nine to go, referencing the number of MPs in Parliament and obviously calling for the murder of more MPs. They also changed their um, Google uh, listing to. Uh, death to traitors, freedom for Britain, explicitly referencing Thomas Mayer, what Thomas Mayer said in court. All this was just, you know, kind of fuel to the fire and a massive justification um, for the eventual banning of the group. One thing you mentioned is they were becoming more and more extreme. They were actually, uh, I think as we say in the afterward, they'd more or less turned away from doing kind of public uh, facing um, things they were no longer kind of trying to recruit they're no longer trying to kind of expand and they're actually becoming less public facing what effect do you think prescription has specifically on groups that are already going in that direction towards um the underground well yeah like you said um they'd already um uh, um for research researching our afterward or like rereading a lot of the literature that was happening um as they were being prescribed and after they were being prescribed, there's a particular article by uh, a guest of the show we've had on, James Poulter, um, in which he, he said um, that, you know, they were already going towards secret meetings uh, or like private meetings and having video clips from these meetings being put on the internet, up on the internet afterwards. They already had a, a very elaborate kind of... Um, security procedure in which it took a long time for you to become a member through the initial application to the website through to a series of interviews about your kind of ideological commitment checks on your passport like this wasn't an organization that was open to expansion that was open towards a kind of a mass of people coming in in fact they kind of gloried in their kind of select nature um the this idea of the political soldier um the the elite are keeping themselves extreme and pure to carry on this kind of Nazi kind of ideology um, until it could reach, reach a mass audience again. And so prescription um, kind of uh, didn't have an impact um, in many respects. Um, instead, unlike the BUF, which you know pivoted towards moderation and mass, mass politics and building back up its base, National Action went underground, uh, got more extreme, 
And eventually, after a series of kind of arrests and kind of uh, investigations into the group is with regards to like kind of terrorism acts offences and other offences which are staring at racial hatred, went on to kind of more violent projects and more violent plots fairly quickly within a period of around six months. And it, it, it can be argued that they were going in this direction anyway. And in fact, a lot of our kind of argument about the effect prescription had is relies on this kind of like tendency towards extremity that they were displaying. It certainly accelerated the process and uh, made it much easier to kind of justify the more, ex- the more extremist turn, in my opinion. Z- since the prescription, and indeed, even like this year, this month, September, so last month, um, the state has taken an even more public interest in far-right terror. Um, the head of National Counter-Terrorist Apparatus declared the far-right terror to be the fastest growing threat, although obviously he made clear that uh, Islamist terror was still like the number one threat, according to the British state. There was a series of like kind of factoids that he put out there. So seven of the last 21 terror plots that were foiled were... Um, uh, far right in origin let's talk a bit more kind of generally about what we think the role of the state should be one of the things we mentioned in the afterward is that the a lot of the policing of um, the far right because the far right is seen uh, probably accurately as um, increasingly prominent uh, piece of the kind of the, the threat to the state and also the threat to people um, in the uk because it's seen as increasing in threat a lot of the policing capacities and a lot of the surveillance capacities have moved over towards MI5, who, of course, um, have a lot of uh, history doing this, not only with Islamist groups, but also with uh, groups in the North of Ireland. So the, the question really for anti-fascists who want to kind of persist in their critique of the state to say that the state shouldn't ideally be involved in anti-fascism at all, what they have to be able to do is to develop those capacities, so develop the kinds of surveillance networks that develop the kind of ways of understanding far-right groups at a really granular level and also getting into these far-right groups um, in the way the state is able to do but uh, largely anti-fascists are not how can anti-fascists go about developing their capacities in such a way as the state becomes obsolete or becomes less important in the kind of whole approach to these uh, increasingly extreme groups i think basically we're never going to there's never going to be a replacement of the state uh, or the state capacity to intervene in anti-fascism or fascism, um, or indeed any kind of political movement, uh, while there still is like a state with with certain levels of like kind of uh, power or hegemony, um, we're gonna. And the, the the problem that anti-fascists had is that they kind of argued. I feel you know kind of fruitlessly that the state should have no role without recognizing that they have no pa- they have no power to impel the state not to intervene and in fact the state is going to continue to intervene whether they argue whatever they argue or whatever they do and in fact we we need to we need uh, anti facts need to take account of that in their uh, in their activities and in their movements and I do think we need to build anti facts need to build up their capacities to uh, counter more extreme far right threats and to, and to be more in depth in our opposition as well and so at the moment a lot of anti-fascism is, is limited to the kind of public opposition in demonstrations which is really important but when a group f- like National Action or the splinters of National Action don't do public demonstrations and stay in, in their in their rooms and stay in private meetings and, and planning acts of violence we uh, anti-fascists have no response to that really um, at the moment this is the kind of th- way we need to kind of broaden our activities and broaden our kind of understanding of of the current far-right fascist moment in order to take into account these other forms of anti-fascism that don't find the expression on the street. So, like, like I said, the state is not going to uh, leave this alone. Um, they're going to continue to police the bounds of uh, acceptable pub- uh, political activity. And we're going to have to find ways of accommodating that without ceding ground uh, like some anti-fascists do to the state as being the only way of solving the fascist problem uh, and the way we kind of uh, defeat fascism is to vote in centre-left parties, uh, prosecute people for hate crimes and uh, pursue prescription of far-right groups. Whatever you whatever you think of state anti-fascism, the state is itself says it's not infallible in stopping um, terror attacks and in fact is not is proven time and again to not be infallible uh, and therefore we need to be taking some of this work on ourselves uh, no matter what the state does and for a more nuanced and for indeed a more kind of total answer to the question of what the what anti-fascists should do in relation to the state you'll have to buy 
the book, which is called The Trouble with National Action. Uh, yeah, by uh, Mark Hayes. So 12 Wars for What is part of a kind of circle, I guess, or a kind of group of podcasts called Channel Zero, which is um, kind of mutually supportive podcasts from the, uh, the left. Uh, every uh, episode, we play one of advert for a show on that network. We suggest you go and check it out. Maybe uh, on one of their episodes, one of their podcasts, you'll hear an ep- uh, advert for us. And so it's kind of a, a way in which we can kind of do mutual aid in the podcast space. So check it out. This is an advert for one of their podcasts. It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. Other costs and the website costs and we are mentioned in the promo video so look out for that online we'll be we'll be uh, promoing it when it when it is released so if you want to uh, see that and indeed anything else we're doing you can follow us on twitter we're at 12 rules for what and soon we will have youtube videos as well which is extremely exciting bye